The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Mighty and immortal God, there is much in this life that weighs us down, causing us not to experience life in its fullest. Empower us to seek the things that produce life for all. Give us strength of mind and spirit so that we might rise victorious through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The lesson is from the 58th chapter of the book of Isaiah. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Today's second lesson is from the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the holy city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? And that time his, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed our God is a consuming fire. This is the word of the Lord. The thirteenth chapter. Glory to Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, do not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? 
And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at the wonderful things that he was doing. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The other week I came across a Calvin and Hobbes uh, comic that I think is fitting for today. So you got to use your mind's eye for, for a second. So the first panel, Calvin was walking into the house and his mom looks at him. He's just, just covered with dirt. And his mom looks at him and says, goodness, you're filthy. Into the tub with you. So the next panel, Calvin is in the tub and he says, I obey the letter of the law, if not the spirit. The third panel, you see his mom yelling from downstairs, let's hear some water running. The third panel at which Calvin's getting out of the tub fully dressed and says, ah, nuts. Okay. Maybe I'll email it on the network so you'll see it. So, you know, and I don't, I don't often do this, but I feel the need that I have to defend the leader of the synagogue in our gospel lesson. Because, you know, he was correct. You are not supposed to work on the Sabbath. In Exodus 20, when God gave the fifth commandment to honor the Sabbath, it essentially says, since God created everything in six days and rested on the Sabbath, so you too shall do all your work on six days and rest on the Sabbath, on the seventh. And that one day of the week is meant to be a day to reconnect to God who created and still sustains all things. And to remember that God is God and we are not. And so the world won't fall apart if we take a break. And this law was first given, if you think about it, this law was first given to people who never had the luxury of choosing whether or not or how long to work. You see, when you spend your entire life as a slave, you work when and how long your master tells you to, and most of the time, that's every single day. So for a group of people who had only known work, this commandment to rest, the fact that there was even another reality than constant work was received as life-giving. I think related to all of this, I wonder if we wouldn't do a better job if we honored the Sabbath and took it more serious. I mean, I know we're not slaves the way the Israelites were slaves, but I would bet that there are still things in each of our lives that demand our time, that kind of suck our energy, that cause us to get disconnected from ourselves and from others in the world around us that are, as I like to call, not life-giving. Though we're not slaves, there are many in this world, there are many in this country who are depressed, exhausted, overstimulated, and just generally anxious. And sometimes, if I'm honest with myself, I would be a whole lot better if someone told me to stop. Whatever it is, to put it down, to step away, to turn it off, to disconnect in order to reconnect with what truly matters. My wife Karen occasionally reminds me, and, and, and I do need reminding, that Facebook or the other apps on my cell phone or just the internet in general won't like blink out of existence if I put it down for a while. She's like, you know, it'll still be there later. Sometimes I don't always believe that because I seem like I'm always on it. See, the Hebrew word Sabbat, which is where we get Sabbath, is derived from the verb, the Hebrew verb, Sabbat, which actually means to stop. So honoring the Sabbath is to honor the stop. I mean, think about that. That's what the Sabbath is, to stop 
all the unhealthy, wear you out, not ultimately good for you, not life-giving things that can easily decenter our lives. And honestly, the synagogue leader knew that. And that's what the synagogue leader was trying to honor. Because he knows that when you start making exceptions for this thing or that, pretty soon no one is really keeping the Sabbath. And it's, just a po- it's lost its point altogether. And it's not just the Sabbath. All of the law is like that. Keep making exceptions, and it's not really a law anymore. It's just a suggestion with little or no power to shape our lives, to preserve, and to protect us. For example, Fiorillo LaGuardia in 1935, when he was the mayor of New York, showed up at night court one night in one of the poorest wards in the city, and he dismissed the the court, the judge, and he he took over the bench. And one one of the cases involved an elderly woman who was caught stealing bread to feed her grandchildren. And the mayor said, For this crime you've committed, I have to punish you. According to the law, the punishment is $10, or today's dollars, but about $180, or 10 days in jail. You see, the mayor had to fulfill the law. People can't just go around taking things that don't belong to them. And by law, this woman was guilty of the crime and had to be punished. But... Right after spelling out the punishment, the mayor, took, the mayor grabbed his hat, threw the $10 in his hat, passed it around the courtroom, and fined everybody in the courtroom 50 cents for, as he said, being in a city where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. And so when the hat came back around, the woman left the courtroom with her fine paid and the equivalent of about $800 today. So I tell this story because first, before we go any further, we have to understand that what the synagogue leader said was actually right. When he reminded the people that they had six other days to work. But unfortunately, in being right, one can also miss the point altogether. Calvin's mom told him to get in the bathtub. And technically, even though he was fully dressed and did not run the water, he fulfilled the letter of the law, which was get in the bathtub. Calvin was right, though he missed his mom's point altogether. But like he said, he obeys the letter of the law. Just like the synagogue leader is obeying the letter of the law. And I think there are a whole lot of people that would, I think, characterize and criticize Christians for being a letter of the law people. That religion is all about a list of do's and don'ts. And you can rank and value people based on whether they keep the do's and don'ts. But if that's what they think religion is primarily about or what you think it primarily is about, then they miss the point altogether. They miss the intent of the law. See, the letter of the law is to honor the Sabbath, is to not work. But the intent of the third commandment is to promote life. It prohibited work in order to be life-giving for the individuals that feel like they have to work all the time. In fact, every commandment that God has given is given in order to promote life within a community and among each other so everyone can experience life to its fullest. See, according to uh, Reverend David, uh, Dr. David Loos, who is a past preaching professor at Luther Seminary and is now the president of Philadelphia Seminary, he said the purpose of the law is to provide us guidance in how to live with each other so that all of us may give more, get more out of this life and the world we share. The law, in short, promotes civility, cooperation, and health. It, tends, it lends a certain order to our lives, order that creates space in which everyone can flourish and grow. The point of God's law is to help all people flourish and grow. And that's what the synagogue leader missed 
completely. You see, what God is primarily about, what the kingdom of God is primarily about, and what Jesus is primarily about through all of his ministry is life. God created life out of nothing. God saved the Hebrew people from death and rescued them out of slavery so that they could live a life of freedom. Jesus came and was enfleshed in this life. And what Jesus does throughout his ministry from birth to death is all about promoting and providing life to its fullest. Jesus will even say in the Gospel of John that I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. And, and this might come as a shock to you, even the resurrection of Jesus is about life. And every week, we invite people to come into this community, to come up to this table, to receive the blood, bread, body and blood of Jesus Christ, to experience a foretaste of the life to come when all the distinctions that separate us are gone, when all come to the feast of God's presence where death and mourning and crying will be no more and life will reign and we can experience a bit of that with forgiveness of sins and knowing our love and our place in God's life and we can experience that in this life now. I really don't know how much I can be any more clear. God cares about life. All life, not just for you and me, but for all people everywhere at all time. The quality of life people lead. And so, of course, Jesus would restore this crippled woman to wholeness at any time. But of course, he would do it on the Sabbath because, for you do's and don'ts people, there is never a law against life, especially on the Sabbath. So this, this may be the first time you hear this up front on a Lutheran sermon, but the law is good. Let me say it another way. The intent of the law, of God's law, is good. My prayer is that as Christians, we never act like Calvin or the synagogue leader and miss the intent of the law in following the letter of the law. Because in missing that, we will miss living life more fully. And my challenge for you and for this community is now that we realize that God's intent is life, how are you? in your world, among your neighbors and family and friends, and how are we as a community going to promote life? How are we going to make our relationships and our interactions with this world life-giving? How are we going to promote a world and society that is life-giving for all people, especially, as I remind you with my sermon last week, those that are the least of these, the poor, the vulnerable, and the voiceless. If this is really God's intent, if God's intent is for life to reign in our lives, in our world, how are we going to live this out? Amen. God make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day. Strength for 
reach new day.